Thank you, John, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm honored to and, and grateful to be able to present here and just so thrilled to have been involved in, in REV. Uh, there's, a, there's a balance, there's a kind of tone that, we, that REV really struck this year. It's about the mix of talks and discussions. It's about the attendees, it's about the audience too, and the hallway conversations. There's a really nice, comfortable blend here of what's important in business, in engineering, in data science, et cetera. Um, and it's kind of rare to, to encounter that. So we're really thrilled about it. Um, I definitely want to shout out uh, also, you know, you've seen John up here too, doing fantastic work on MCing here and putting this all together. Also, Karina Babcock is our other co-chair and deserves a round of applause for really getting all this put together. <laughs> and I, I should mention, the stats just came in, Karina sent over, uh, we've had almost, uh, almost 700 people registered. So we had 668 people registered and uh, just about uh, 600 checked in and got their badges. So that's more than twice of what we had last year, really good growth on that, so congrats. Um, my talk, let me put this up here if I've got the right, okay, I'll put this up here while I introduce. Um, so if you wanna grab the slides, they'll be on Twitter, uh, but you can also, if you've got a smartphone, just uh, you know, use the QR code and you can load it up on your phone. Uh, definitely there'll be a lot of slides, probably more material than needed, but some background if you wanna drill down, and a lot of links, and I have a hunch that some of these links you may wanna chase down later. Uh, so a lot of the work that I do is in developing themes, uh, going out in industry and finding out what are interesting projects and uh, you know, what kind of changes do those imply? Who are the people who are making change happen? What are the issues that they share in common that they're struggling with? And how can we surface this? So that's one of the things that I do working with, oh great, okay, great. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, working with Domino, I, I do a monthly column uh, about trying to surface some of these themes that we're seeing. And I'd like to show some of the past of where we've come from uh, in data science. Uh, definitely there's other people who've, who've talked more about that and we'll point to them. Uh, but also kind of a lens of how to examine how things have changed over the decades in data science and then apply that to uh, really four kind of burning issues, some really big hot buttons for what we're contending with now and what does this indicate for us going forward. Uh, so first up, uh, if you haven't seen this, John Tookie, by the way, we have socks for John Tookie. So. Um, let me see, let's take this up. I know we have a sock here someplace. But I don't spill the contents. Yes, I actually have the John Tookie socks. Check this out, isn't this awesome? So we've got John Tookie socks. John Tookie was uh, a mathematician at Bell Labs, and back in 1962, he wrote a paper called The Future of Data Analysis. And just to frame it, back in 1962, even a lot of universities didn't have computers yet. So the idea of being able to use machines to crunch data that was still relatively new, it was sort of, it was the future. It was almost science fiction for a lot of people. And so the implications of what was coming up, of being able to do a lot of data analysis and move forward with a lot of number crunching and what the implications would be, um, this was all still very new. And so Tukey did this paper. Uh, it's, it's a great read. Um, it's you know, definitely you know, 50, almost 60 years ago. But the thing is, he was talking about something that was interdisciplinary. He was saying, really, this doesn't belong just in statistics. And, uh, and if you look into Tukey, uh, while he's on the socks there, he did incredible work in stats. Um, he also really informed a lot of the early thinking about uh, data visualization. And if you, if you read Edwards after you take his classes, you'll hear all about John Tukey. Um, but the point there was, what was emerging was interdisciplinary. It involved a lot of work with computing machinery and automation. It involved a lot of interesting work on something new that was data management. It involved a lot of work with applied math and some depth in statistics and visualization and also a lot of the communication skills involved. Um, there's other people who've talked about this, these kinds of histories much more. Also, we'll have uh, Chris Wiggins will be uh, from New York Times and Columbia will be speaking later today. And uh, Chris has done fantastic work chronicling a lot of in-depth histories as well as teaching about this now. Um, so I definitely recommend Chris's talk. Uh, I recently did 50 Years of Data Management and Beyond, which looks at roughly the same time period over the decades Really, we see in each decade, uh, there are challenges that the industry was struggling with in terms of business needs for data management. And there are new types of frameworks that evolved roughly each decade to address these kind of needs. And to borrow a page from Marshall McLuhan, 
Uh, if you've ever heard uh, the medium is a message, uh, that, that euphemism, really it's, that's a very, very dense statement of it. And what McLuhan was talking about was that when new media is introduced, it does not replace the former media. It merely makes it more complicated. And we see this also in terms of our history of managing data, that as new types of data management frameworks came out, they didn't replace what was there before. I mean, arguably hierarchical databases from the 60s are some of the most important and popularly used for transactions right now in terms of like credit cards. But the thing is they make them more complicated. And so understanding how and why to use different types of data frameworks and what implications does that have on the decisions that you make, the outcomes, the, the insights that you surface. Um, so here's a couple of pieces of history. Uh, there, there's plenty others. The point being though is that this came out of industry, not academia. And to some extent, academia still struggles a lot with how to, you know, how to, how to stick data science into some sort of discipline. Um, even some of the, the great programs that I see in universities, they still, they'll tie it to electrical engineering over here or statistics over there, kind of pigeonhole it. But it's interdisciplinary and we'll talk more about that. Uh, so, through the, the past six decades, since Tukey first described some of this phenomenon, there's been a kind of effect that happens over and over. And you can use this as a kind of a lens to, uh, to analyze what's happening at any given point during this history, ostensibly going forward. And this lens is described in four steps. One, hardware capabilities evolve, and they usually go in bursts. There's step functions. And that's because hardware capabilities are about really basic work in physics, and a lot of work in, in uh, research in electrical engineering, but also a lot of work in material science. And that just doesn't happen incrementally. That happens in, in big steps. And then software adapts. So software is reactive to what happens in hardware in a lot of ways. And so software evolves new kinds of abstraction layers. And speaking as a computer scientist, uh, you know, we work with peddling different types of abstraction layers, as well as different types of conceptual ways of controlling systems. And then, taken together, these lead to big surges in compute capacity, you know, CPU, memory, networking, storage, et cetera. And along with that, we see jumps in data rates. Those two ratchet up over time. And the way that industry typically evol uh, responds to this is to apply increasingly more advanced mathematics for the business use cases. And ultimately, it's the more advanced mathematics that become economically very important to put down into the hardware layer. So, you know, case in point, um, if you were to talk about predictive analytics 20 years ago, the main people in the field would have laughed you out of the room. They would have said, you know what, predictive analytics, yeah, not so much. And my professors, are, uh, like Brad Efren and others, uh, famously uh, made some real good thoughts about this too. If you were to go out 10 years ago and talk about the importance of machine learning in industry, and I was out there doing that, you get a lot of pushback. People say, you know, Google, Amazon, maybe, but for most enterprise, using machine learning, not really. It's, it's not gonna happen. You know, companies like telecom and insurance, they don't really need machine learning. But that changed. If you were out five years ago talking in industry about the importance of graphs and graph algorithms and representation of graph data because most business data ultimately is some form of graph, and you were to talk about the math, the advanced math that's required to be down low layer in the hardware for graphs, you get immense push pushback. And I, I know I did that uh, because you start talking not just about matrices and vectors, you talk about something called tensors and tensor decomposition. And five years ago, people laughed. It's like, why on earth would any business people care about anything called tensor? But you know, now Google is spending, uh, what, 10 figures uh, marketing TensorFlow? I don't know, sorry, apologies. Um, so this thing happens over and over. Uh, and one application of this is regarding data governance. Uh, again, we did a column in Domino about this. Uh, also, I did an executive briefing for O'Reilly um, over the past year. And so if you want, check out those links. There's a lot more details about data governance. But you know, I, I learned that data governance, it's an interesting idea, but there's been a lot of false starts. Kind of a dry topic. But in the context of machine learning over the past few years, this is suddenly not a dry topic. This is suddenly arguably one of the most, if not the most important issues that we're dealing with now. So let's, let's dig into this a bit. Um, 
And, and, and so, by the way, uh, I got assigned a topic by Ben Lorica out of O'Reilly uh, to really study what's happening in, in uh, what's changing in data governance. And so we can draw this from some historical context. Back in the 70s, we had really big boxes, mainframes. And uh, I started programming in the 70s. I don't know, anybody else start programming in the 70s? Please, it'll make me feel better. Thank you, great, okay, I feel much better. We had these big boxes, and they weren't terribly differentiated. Uh, you ran applications on these big boxes, and the applications would call some libraries in the operating system. But like every application ran some data, some networking if it needed to. It wasn't really differentiated. Um, they had other terminal devices like card readers and maybe green screens, teletypes. Those were connected over proprietary wires, and that's how things were. And then going into the 80s, we had the boxes become differentiated. You had different types of servers running around. Some of them began acting as clients, so they could make calls over open standards for networking. Now Ethernet comes up. So you've got open standards for protocols where one server can call another, uh, and access an API. So you get some differentiation, and you get this client-server architecture that was so big. When I was in grad school, our department saw the launch of two new ideas, one of them a uh, little iffy at first, but it turned out big, it was called Sun Workstations, and the other one a little iffy, they got busted by the university, but it turned out pretty big. Uh, university took a nice equity stake, it was called Cisco. And uh, meanwhile, there's a guy upstairs, Vint Cerf, who created this new thing called TCPIP. So it was kind of fun being a grad student and seeing a lot of these things launch. There was a little bit of data governance because there were now database servers, but still not much. Going into the 90s, then we moved past networking into internetworking, and we had, yeah, TCP IP. We had a lot of interesting network protocols, led to an explosion of things, World Wide Web, et cetera. Instead of just client server, now we had even more differentiation. This got more complex. We had three tiers, three layers. The presentation layer was about, say, web browsers, right? What you could do in a web browser. But the business logic kept getting more and more progressively rolled back into the middle layer, um, also called application servers, web servers, uh, later being called middleware. And then in the bottom tier, you had your data management, your back office, right? And along with your database servers, you had uh, you know, data warehousing and business intelligence. And some of the data governance started to really come in there, but it's really focused more on the warehouse. And then things changed. So uh, leading up into the 2000s, you can pinpoint a uh, time, Q3 of 1997. There were four teams identified. By that point, they had all reached the same conclusion, and they were pursuing pretty much the same solution to it. And it's really great to go back and, again, chase the links here on the slides. Greg Linden's uh, article about splitting the website at Amazon, and uh, Eric Brewer talking about Inktomi, the origins of Yahoo Search, um, Jeff Dean talking about the origins of Google, which don't even get me started. Um, and then Randy Shoup, a friend, uh, talking about how eBay evolved from just like four servers into many. What happened was they all recognized that at the time when you had database servers, as your business grew, you would get a bigger and bigger hardware box and you would get a bigger and bigger license from Oracle. And they realized that with e-commerce and the growth rates that they were seeing, number one, they couldn't get big enough boxes. And number two, they wouldn't be able to afford the Oracle license. Um, so instead, these four teams, what they did was to say, okay, let's take that big monolithic web app and split it and run it on thousands of commodity hardware servers, Linux mostly. Um, and so we'd have server farms. Now the trouble with server farms is that these kind of commodity hardware, they fall over a lot. So you want to have a lot of logging on them and just check how they're doing. Um, and as by virtue of that, if you take those log files of customer interactions and you aggregate them, and then you take that aggregated data and you run machine learning models on them, you can produce data products that you feed back into your web apps, and you get this kind of flywheel effect in business. And that leads to what Andrew Ng has famously called the, uh, the virtuous cycle of data. And so that was the origins of cloud, those server farms, that was the origins of big data, that was the origins of this rapid increase of data in the world, of machine data, and also the business use cases for machine learning. Now, another thing that happened here was this was the 2000s. This is when uh, cloud was launched. Uh, we get much more interesting work in architectures, also a lot of interesting threats and an evolution on the security front of what was happening. And I was working in network security back then. Um, you had IDSs, you had bump in the wire application gateways, you had uh, SIMs and other things coming together. A lot more intelligence being pushed out to the edge, and that's a theme. 
And you also had the launch of smartphones. So there's a lot more mobile devices. So this landscape starts getting pretty complex. The data governance, however, is still pretty much over on the data warehouse. And then we roll out a decade later. And toward the end of the 2000s is when you first started getting teams in industry, uh, as, as Josh Wells was showing really brilliantly last night, um, you first started getting some teams identified as data science teams. And I, I led a couple of the early teams to be identified as data science back then. Um, and so coming into the 2010s, we had data science practice, we had evolution of big data tooling, we had a lot more sophisticated use of the big data and what was going on in the cloud. You started to see point solutions. Uh, I went to a meeting with, at Starbucks with uh, the founder of Relation right before they launched in 2012 with the proverbial back of the napkin. So data governance on big data, uh, you know, that was starting to happen. Um, you also saw much more strategic use of data science. Those workflows would feed back into your business analytics. And security continued to evolve, cloud continued to evolve, more and more mobile devices. And then we roll the clock up to now and where we're at. And it's a much more complex landscape. Going into the 2020s, this is what, uh, actually what Thomas and, and Alex were describing. Uh, it was really brilliant on the panel. I, I love that. Uh, so many important points that they touched on. I'm really, my talk is more about impact uh, unpacking some of those themes and showing a timeline behind it. But you know, here, okay, great, we've got this complex landscape, tons of data sharing, data per, uh, an economy of data, external data, tons of mobile devices. Now we have low power devices and inference running on them. You can take TensorFlow.js and drop your deep learning model six orders of magnitude and run it on uh, devices that don't even have batteries. Um, okay, so we've got a really complex landscape the data governance parts of it have become more and more important. There's compliance surrounding all this because this really matters now. But yet, the data governance solutions, they're point solutions. You've got some for your mobile devices, some for your edge inference, some for your, your edge security and CDNs like Cloudflare and, and um, AWS Shield and others, some for big data, some for data warehouse, et cetera. But there's nothing common. There's no tech stack there, really. There's Egeria, there's some open standards that are evolving, but that really has to be solved. And arguably, that's one of the biggest problems we have. It's also a driver for data science. So 2018 was what Wall Street Journal called a global reckoning on data governance. And if you don't know, there were hundreds of millions of people affected worldwide during 2018 uh, with data breaches, sorry, security breaches, and then uh, private, data privacy leakage. Um, it's also the year that uh, GDPR went into effect, and I was I, I did video interviews with a couple of the biggest firms affected by that, like two days before it went into effect in London. It was great. Um, now we have CCPA coming online next year in California and other states throughout the US uh, following suit with the uh, GDPR style of, of uh, uh, regulations. Um, of course, that was also the year that we had uh, the whole news cycle about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. And arguably, a lot of interesting problems are surfacing about ad-based business models and about the corporate surveillance that goes into it. Um, you see Facebook in the news cycle. You see Facebook up in front of Congress. Arguably, Oracle's an even bigger player in this, although they're a little bit more sophisticated in how they do their PR spin. Um, but they're, they're, as far as corporate surveillance, Oracle is probably the biggest fish there. So what I'm trying to say is this evolution of system architecture, the hardware driving the software layers, and also, the whole landscape with regard to threats and risk, it, it, it changes things. It, it changes how we had, have to respond to it. And so you see these drivers involving risk and cost, but also opportunity. Again, some of what, what Thomas and Alex were talking about. These are the things that change us and change our industry. And really, this is what puts the premium on how do we have to leverage data science teams. This is why you get the return on investment for data science. So that's where we stand now. And these are the kind of challenges that we're facing. Um, I, I recently, uh, my colleague Ben Lorick at O'Reilly, um, he and I did, uh, Ben and I just did three surveys about industry, large surveys about adoption for ABC. So that's AI, big data, and cloud in enterprise. And uh, we have an article on this uh, on Domino. Uh, also, these surveys, these are mini books. If you want to grab them, they're free downloads. Uh, we've just done three. We've got another two in the pipeline. But what we were trying to do is a contrast study. We were trying to look at, for the, the big fish, for the enterprise firms who are adopting data science, the ones that are successful, 
that have been out and doing machine learning models in production for five years or more, let's do a contrast between those and the ones who are just barely even getting started yet. You know, what's the delta? What can we learn from that? And so I've tried to represent some of the high-level findings as a, a survival analysis here. You can think about having three buckets. There's the companies that are basically non-starters. They're not really getting into this yet. And there's some companies that, you know, they've got a couple few years into it, they're developing their practices, they're, they're evaluating and adopting. And then you've got other companies that, again, they've had five years or more success in uh, machine learning and production. And so what is in common amongst each bucket? So when you look at the, the laggards, the non-starters, uh, number one, they're buried in technical debt. And if you look at their data infrastructure, the one thing they complain about in common especially is that they've got too much data, uh, tech debt to solve in terms of their, their collaboration tools, their data infrastructure just doesn't support it. They're fighting with silos on data. And really, uh, that stuff takes years. Those kinds of enterprise transformations take years to fix. And then the problem is that even if they got started today, it would take a long time. The trouble is they're not gonna get started today because from the top, the company culture does not recognize the need. It's not a priority. And this is coming from the top exec levels, board of directors, et cetera. And so if you don't have that company culture, you're not gonna get past these hurdles. And even if you do have buy-in from the top, the other problem is they just don't have enough people in effectively product management roles, people who can translate from technology capabilities into business opportunities. And if you don't have those people in the line units, it's not gonna happen. Um, and so if you, if you add up those three challenges, that knocks out more than 50% of enterprise. More than 50% of enterprise is years away from being competitive in this area. And moreover, not only just being competitive, but as, as uh, uh, the past panel was talking about, think about the business efficiency. How many billions of dollars do they have to invest, and how efficient is that compared with the ones that have first mover advantage? So they're years away from being up uh, to that point. If you look into the middle bucket, they have three things that they report in common. One is data quality, cleaning up data, lack of labeled data, and you know what? They should be concerned about that. That's the big hot button, and that's great. They're working on it. They also complain about the talent crunch. They simply cannot find enough people with the right skills to hire, and they're having troubles reskilling, upskilling for their existing workforce, and that's perpetually a problem. And the other thing, another phenomenon that we reported last year was once you do start to get your ducks in the row, once you've covered the table stakes, and you start to have collaborative infrastructure for surfacing data insights, um, there's some things that come to the fore. You start to notice, hey, we've got some security problems. Hey, we've got some data privacy problems. Hey, we've got some fairness and bias problems. Hey, we've got some other ethics and compliance issues, and we're gonna have to take care of that. So you get into a lot of competing priorities for, for, uh, for capital and, and for time. Now, working down to the mature part of this, they report two things in common. One is about workflow reproducibility. It's very important, but in terms of machine learning, because you're dealing with stochastic systems, reproducible workflows is a very hard problem. Um, another thing is about uh, hyperparameter tuning. There are companies out there like Determined AI that are doing really fantastic work on this. What this means is the mature practices do not want to spend all of their money on the cloud vendors. They'd like to do something more efficient when they're training a lot of deep learning models. So, um, but the thing is that the, the problems down in the mature bucket, those, those are optimizations. They aren't showstoppers. Those are nice problems to have. So this is a way of looking at companies and evaluating where are they at. What are the struggles they're dealing with? Also a good way of looking at vendors and seeing what are the pain points that they're addressing. How big is this opportunity? Um, another way to look at it is you can break it into different segments and look at liabilities and assets. Frankly, the, the, the companies that are in the middle that aren't necessarily the tech unicorns, they're really interesting because they tend to have a lot of people with domain expertise. And they also tend to have a lot of access to interesting data sets, data exhaust that isn't monetized yet. Uh, and, and so they have ways, they have a path if they want to take on and compete against the, the first mover, the, the tech giants, because typically the tech giants do not have the domain expertise. Uh, and, and so there have been studies. O'Reilly's doing these studies. Um, MIT Sloan has done some fantastic studies, a lot of which I've, I've uh, summarized some here and I have links into. Also, McKinsey Global Institute, Michael Chu and others uh, have a, an incredible study, slightly terrifying. Um, the thing is that these studies are converging 
and they tend to show the same thing. Basically, there's a gap between the haves and the have-nots in terms of companies that are using data, or data-informed correctly, model-informed, et cetera. And, uh, and that gap is widening. Now, in terms of our contrast study, what are the companies that are doing it right? What do they report in common? Um, number one, they use specialized roles. So they've embraced the use of data science teams and data engineering teams in lieu of just saying, no, no, that's a business analyst. That's one marker. Another one is that to uh, Nick's point in his keynote yesterday, it was excellent about um, using experts, internal data science teams. This is what the winners in the game do. The ones that don't fare so well tend to rely on external consultants. Um, and another thing that really surprised us was that the more sophisticated companies have practices about using robust checklists. They've made mistakes before. They're not going to make those same mistakes again. They're curating checklists of what to do and what not to do when they're rolling out machine learning models in production. And that's good. I'm really glad to see that. We're actually surprised that they're being that proactive. Um, and the fourth point is something that surprised us completely. Uh, you know, typically when you think about running projects, running teams, in terms of setting the priorities for projects, in terms of describing what are the key metrics for success for a project, that usually falls on product management. But in terms of the sophisticated companies using data science, they're leaning more on their data science leads in lieu of their product managers. And again, drilling down into that, what that means is if you take product management and just try to drag it across from web app development and game development and things like that, um, and try to use that kind of embedded institution, it doesn't work. And so the, the book really isn't written yet about product management in this area, although uh, Pete Skomarok will be talking later today and definitely listen to what he's saying. Uh, what he's talking about is not out in the line units yet, but it needs to be. Alrighty, um, where did this happen? Where did this gap start to emerge? And uh, so I can point to the year 2001. It was very interesting. Um, for one thing, there had been something, a small matter called the dot-com bust that happened. Um, just a small matter. And then also it was the heyday for data warehousing and BI. I mean, arguably notions of BI come from the late 50s. They really were, they were really articulated well in the late 80s, but they got traction throughout the 90s. And that became a kind of embedded institution. Uh, frankly, leading data science teams early on, you almost always had to struggle against the BI teams. Um, it was also the year, 2001, when Agile Manifesto was published. And this became another kind of embedded institution, one that we're still struggling with. And the thing is, it, it, how many people have read the Agile Manifesto? Okay, so I'll say like 20, 30%, maybe. Um, the word data doesn't appear, and so it wasn't a priority for them. They weren't thinking about data. That was an afterthought. They were thinking about iterating on code base. And so a generation of developers, they, they, they came of age equating database with relational, which is not true. Um, and by virtue of that, they, their level of sophistication with data was that the legibility of systems, the, the, the sell, part of the selling point for relational, um, that that equates to legibility of data. And that is really not true. That's, that's a way to tank a company. Um, but even so, the, the companies with first mover advantage, they made this sharp left turn toward NoSQL. And what we're doing in data science, they, they really abandoned a lot of previous practices. Um, you know, they moved fast and they broke things. And so the real chronicle on that, the one that I love is uh, Leo Bremen's a paper called Two Cultures from 2001, where he really chronicled this kind of sea change and really talked about the rise of predictive analytics, even though a lot of his colleagues were uh, deriding him for it. Um, and the way that I would characterize this is that we've had a generation of mainstream developers who've been taught that coding is eminent and data is secondary. And that's pervasive in industry still. But yet the first mover companies have changed to think that learning is eminent and data is a competitive differentiator. Now those two statements don't reconcile. And there are a lot of people who believe the former and won't adopt the latter. You can't just retrain them if they don't believe it. And this is a fundamental disconnect that we're struggling with. And it may be that for people in the former category, if they, if they don't level up to it, well, there's you know, some good construction jobs. <laughs> and here's why, because the business executives know better. The business executives who are seeing the value of data science and being model informed, they're the ones who are doubling down on their bets now, and so they're investing a lot more money. This is our biggest surprise out of our surveys. We had like a 5%, 10%, 15, 
And then we had a catch-all for 20 or more percent of IT budgets being invested in machine learning. And in the, in the mature bucket, 43% reported that they were doing 20% or more of their total IT budget was going toward machine learning and data science. And that was a big, big surprise for us. So what I'm saying is that gap is widening. And if you don't recognize that and you don't understand the drivers of why this is changing, really the industry is going to move ahead. So now I want to shift into how can we take some of this tooling and apply it. Um, and so I've got four scenarios and a, a little bit controversial topics, but hopefully providing somewhat of a lens based off of where we've come from, looking toward how it's, how it's resolving and, and where is it going in the future. The first one is about company culture. And so again, talking about executives, uh, in December last year, I was on a workshop for World Economic Forum. We were establishing the, uh, the AI agenda for the Davos conference in Switzerland uh, that happened earlier this year. And a lot of our operating principle in this would be, ha, was based on the finding that when you go out to that 50% or more of enterprise that just doesn't get it about machine learning, the problem is at the top, um, people who are on exec staff, or really even more so, uh, it's the board of directors. And I mentioned that I started programming in the 70s, but you know these folks are probably older than me even. And the thing is that they have learned about Six Sigma, they've built their careers on it, they've learned about Lean, They've learned about a lot of process that requires that you get rid of uncertainty. But now they're being told that these, these younger tech unicorns are coming after them, that they're using machine learning, and the board of directors doesn't understand it. They, you know, it, these are probabilistic systems. How could that make sense? Um, they're being told that they have to embrace uncertainty. That doesn't make sense. Um, but the thing is that if they don't act decisively, their competitors will, and certainly the regulators will. And there's some great voices talking about this. Um, Jacob Ward, he was uh, a principal editor, he was senior editor for Popular Science, he's now at Stanford. And Jacob Ward was the first person, along with Pete Skormarok, uh, those are the first two people who alerted me to the fact that Daniel Kahneman um, and his colleagues were the ones who've really encountered this problem and described it. Um, so I definitely recommend Jacob Ward talking about the impact of behavioral economics on decision based on data. Um, also, another person who's really interesting is uh, Cassie Kovarkov. Uh, she's chief decision scientist at Google Cloud, and she has some great talks about lessons learned, mistakes made at Google deploying machine learning. And so what can Google learn from their mistakes with machine learning? How can that apply in other companies in terms of decisions? And, uh, and really, the best summary on this is from Ajay Agarwal, writing on behalf of McKinsey, talking about the unbundling of decision making. And, uh, and, and how can you have teams of people and machines that collaborate toward large-scale decisions? So the takeaways there are that we have a lot of problem with the unbundling of decision-making. Behavioral economics is a North Star for this. Uh, we have a lot of work to do in terms of corporate governance regarding this. The good news for those of us who do some business development, um, you always want to sell on the upside. So the good news is half the total available market is not even started yet. That's great. Um, the bad news is that for those of us who do some future scenarios, futurism work, um, you know, using our tools like GPT and, and J-curves and the rest, when you start to put the data and the studies together, there's really a convergence point, and it's only about four or five years out, where the gap between the haves and the have-nots becomes critical, and the companies that haven't started yet, they're really too far behind to uh, really be worth investing in. Um, and so they become a lot, it, it's probably indicating a lot of M&A activity. Um, you know, other larger companies who are, who are more progressive would gobble them up to get their customers. But there's a kind of point of no return coming. Um, in another case, there's a lot of demand, like what uh, uh, Donahoe talks about in his history of data science as far as uh, the, the, the demand meme, the jobs meme for data science. That's in good position. We'll have jobs going in the future. Okay, uh, next up, if I can make it through here. And even a, a different scenario, uh, one of the other four, even more controversial, it's about hardware. And what's happening with hardware? And this is the one I probably get the most pushback on. Um, but it's also being picked up by other, other people who are much more notable speakers than I am. Um, so with hardware, for the past 20 years, we've been taught in software engineering, the form of hardware for processors doesn't really change. Um, because of Moore's law, we're, we're going to get processors that are better, faster, cheaper, but don't even bother looking at that. We've got Java and you know, JVM languages. We don't, we don't need to to probe the hardware at all, it's not really an issue. Um, and we have virtualization, you know, it's just don't care about it. The problem is this, 
Hardware is moving faster than software. Software is moving faster than process. You know, we've been taught for the past 20 years that in software engineering, process is this big umbrella thing. You can apply it to a lot of different kinds of projects. But that and the fact that about hardware, that's all changed. And now hardware is evolving more rapidly. Um, certainly on the processor side, you see GPUs. NVIDIA got really lucky having GPUs out there. They didn't really understand why they were becoming so popular so suddenly for machine learning, but it worked in their favor. Um, but not just GPUs, you've got TPUs, IPUs, DWPUs, and a whole range of ASICs, um, Cerebrus. <clears throat> uh, you've got some really interesting companies coming up doing this. It's not just about the processors, it's also about what's going on in the switch fabric, and if you look at some of the origins of TensorFlow, Jeff Dean's early talks about that, um, you know, they're talking about using new kinds of, of networking gear and not necessarily using TCP IP, going beyond that so you can get into sub-millisecond uh, latencies for, for streaming in real time. Um, and that's also being driven uh, a lot, as, as like Alex was just talking about in the last talk. Um, and it's also about memory fabric. You, you know, what Intel is doing with Project Arrow and using FPGAs as intelligent front ends on mem large memory fabric and just the incredible efficiencies that can be gained by that. So Moore's Law is dead, um, but there's hope. And so there are projects, it's like Project Jupyter, as far as open source, the protocol, the open standards part of Jupyter is really accounting for this, more so than many others. Apache Arrow is my favorite project at Apache, and it's also really in the driver's seat there. But also look toward UCB Berkeley, Rise Lab, the whole constellation of Ray and what they're doing. Uh, these projects are very savvy about this change of hardware moving faster than software, moving faster than process. Um, and so a little bit, just, I've got a little bit of time. Um, so in 2005, a colleague had moved to Seattle and he was on a new project and he kept calling me with these really weird questions about a new kind of service. And I was just, I was befuddled about it. Um, but I tried to work as a guinea pig for this thing. And then in 2006, they, they told me to go look at a website and sign up for a thing. And um, so I did, and inadvertently, I became one of the first three people outside of Amazon to do 100% cloud architecture. And my teams were guinea pigs for a lot of the early AWS services coming out. Um, and I've signed a lot of NDAs. I've had a long relationship with Amazon, but that's about all I can say. Um, so uh, roll the clock out. The end of 2006, uh, we were having troubles managing some of our NLP workflows that we were doing. And one of the engineers uh, suggested a new open source project that was, had just come out. And we became one of the early users of it. Um, it was called Hadoop. And then we ran into some bottlenecks running Hadoop in the cloud. So in 2008, there was a JIRA ticket. And uh, as an engineering manager, I wrote a $3,000 check to a young engineer in London named Tom White, <clears throat> who uh, pushed a fix. And uh, we were able to get efficiencies of running Hadoop in the cloud. And then our friends at Amazon called up and said, hey, you've got the biggest Hadoop cluster in the cloud. So we became a case study for what, at the time, it was called Project 157. You'll still see that in the docs, but it was, it was named Elastic MapReduce. Um, a couple, this, about a year later, uh, Berkeley, one of my heroes growing up in this field, was Dave Patterson. <clears throat> and Dave had led his grad students to interview a lot of people who were involved with cloud, a lot of different competitors, and try to understand what's going on. And they wrote this paper. This paper was prescient. It spelled out what would happen over the next five to 10 years in cloud. It just nailed it. Um, I got invited to critique it and uh, then gave a guest lecture at Berkeley. You can see a video of me getting eviscerated by Dave Patterson because I critiqued his paper. Um, but in the audience, there were grad students, first year PhD students, who were, were the founding teams for Apache Mesos and a spinoff called Apache Spark. And if you know about my history, of course, I did a lot of work with, with both of these teams over the years. Um, Dave led his current crop of grad students to publish a follow-up study 10 years of the day um, afterwards. And it's called A Berkeley View on Serverless. And, uh, and if you want to be working in this field, if you haven't read this paper, stop what you're doing, grab the paper and read it. It's, it's worth that investment of time. Um, the point is it's really dealing a lot with uh, work from Eric Jonas in the economics of cloud and how things have shifted. Um, Eric is going off along with, it seems like a lot of the interesting people at Berkeley, going off to U Chicago next year to join Michael Franklin. Um, but the point that they make is really, you can think of it, when AWS first launched, they kind of dumbed it down. They had very sophisticated services inside, but they kind of dumbed it down to make it recognizable to sysadmins and enterprise who were used to using VMware. So they get to slide their apps over. 
But it's 10 years later, and now there's demand for much more higher level functions. And there's this whole umbrella of what's being called serverless. It has a lot of import. And, and really, they're spelling out here why and how, what the risks are, some of the limitations. Uh, but this is what's happening. And if that last paper was prescient for the next five years, seriously, this one is even more so. Part of what they're pointing to is how there's a continued decoupling of compute and storage. And so to translate that, not to get into too much electrical engineering, but what's happening there is basically the drivers for Hadoop and Spark have reversed. And that's why this lab has Ray, which is basically the designated Spark killer. Okay, I gotta, I gotta scoot um, because the time is coming out. So uh, another thing about hardware evolving, we did an, uh, an article on Domino about this, and I'll point to this, Alistair Allen and Pete Warden talking about edge inference and running you know, huge machine learning models on very low power, small footprint uh, devices. There's probably some of these devices in the wall controller units here in this room. Um, and it's kind of terrifying what they're saying, but it's what's happening. And this is even bigger than the, the scope of the other changes I was talking about. So looking forward, Moore's Law is over, but Kumi's Law and with it Landauer's principle, those are in effect. We're going to see vast efficiencies because in some ways Moore's Law allowed us to be extremely sloppy. Um, also look toward Ray. Um, that, that is, when you break down the use cases, that's the thing that's getting rid of Spark. So really look at Ray and Moden and the others that go along with that, how they're leveraging services, how they're leveraging contemporary hardware. Um, and also, increasingly, data science is less about business analytics and more about ed edge inference. If your team isn't thinking that way, you should evaluate it. Okay, I know I'm, I'm out of time. Um, I just want to cover two other things really quick. One is um, shared infrastructure and government meeting enterprise. Um, I was chair for JupyterCon, and Brian Granger and I noticed a lot of enterprise coming into Jupyter in the lead up to the conference. And I'll, I'll say from the perspective of a friend, uh, David Schaff, who's director of data engineering at Capital One, you know, David says, hey, look, on the one hand, I can buy proprietary systems for data infrastructure, and then I have to train my people up maybe six months. On the other hand, I can hire grad students who know how to do machine learning. They can use Python and Jupyter to deploy apps in machine learning that the bank needs on day one. Why on earth would I spend the money to get a proprietary system and then derail my people for six months and not even get as, as effective in a system. So we're seeing a lot of open source, especially Jupyter, coming in to organizations like Capital One. Definitely Bloomberg has made big bets and a lot of contributions, Amazon and others. Also DOD is doing a lot of work with infrastructure based on Jupyter. And so uh, working thesis there for me is the hard problems in data science are no longer in Silicon Valley. They're out in the field. They're especially in large organizations, especially in regulated environments. Increasingly, open source projects are looking toward regulated environments for what features to prioritize. It's also where enterprise finds a lot of common ground, and government. And so we had Julia Lane talking about Coolidge Initiative and, and the work on Project Jupiter to support metadata and data governance and lineage. Um, I'm involved with that as well, consulting for NYU. Also, if you look at talks from like Dave Stewart talking about NB Gallery and how DOD is using uh, uh, large scale infrastructure based on Jupiter, and also how DOD has pushed that source code open on GitHub. Um, and so I think we'll see a lot more non vendor contributions in open source, less committer wars. Uh, certainly that's coming out of government and enterprise. Um, okay, and I know that I'm out of time, but real quick, I'll go through this. Last but not least is model interpretation, and it's not what you think. It's a really super hard problem. So I will point toward, we had uh, the column last month for Domino, goes into detail. Uh, ben Lorca uh, did a great podcast interview with um, Farouk Prasabzi Sangte, and Farouk you know, did her PhD on model interpretation, and then realized, hey, wait a minute, there's some big problems here. Um, I was on a panel uh, a couple months ago with Zach Lipton at CMU, who's also another one of the people going, wait, wait a minute, model interpretation, explainability, some of this is really wrong. And there's important reasons and appeals for making models more interpretable and explainable, and there's needs for data science teams to embrace this and use these tools and reflect and understand what's going on. But in terms of putting these, this kind of tooling in front of stakeholders right now, it's extremely problematic. And just to uh, paraphrase from what Farouk is saying, I definitely recommend her interview. The gist is this. There's a joke going around on Twitter. If it's written in Python, it's machine learning. If it's written in PowerPoint, it's AI. <laughs> and, 
And I mean, there's a gist of truth to that, but it's also harmful. I think that's really the wrong perspective. So machine learning is a subset of mathematical optimization. We could draw equations for loss functions and regularization terms and all that. But we could say that ML is about tools and technology. But the uses of ML, uh, to, to paraphrase Farouk, the use of, of machine learning is ultimately, it involves a lot of human uh, HCI, so human compute interaction. There's a lot of social systems involved. And if you just think that machine learning is about engineering, you lose the other half of the equation. Going forward, what's the application for it? And so if you try to interpret what's going on in machine learning and you're only looking at half the picture, you're going to get it wrong. And so I think you know, another a definition would be to say that AI is about the impact on social systems. Um, and so to, to illustrate this, uh, if we look at complex workflows to, to prepare data training sets and then create models and evaluate them, if we look at the business risk of deploying machine learning models and how to understand what's going on, if we just simply look at the artifact, the model, and try to dissect it, that's a peephole analysis. We're staring through a peephole at a really complex problem. If instead, if we're going to mitigate risk and try to understand and explain models and what's going on, we have to look at the, the information that's throughout the entire workflow, all the way back to collecting the data initially from the business process. And there are people who are working on better ways not to throw away the information and the human input at many, many steps leading up to that point. This is extremely crucial. And this is where data governance comes in, because this is the essence of lineage. And there are great people talking about this much better than me. Chris Ray from Stanford has that whole project. Uh, I'm not even going to get into the lattice. But uh, Snorkel is the open source project. Uh, and Chris is talking about, again, how to leverage lineage. Um, what they're talking about with Snorkel is weak supervision, something they call data programming. How can you make mathematical functions to describe the experts who are providing labels, and where they're good or bad? Um, how can you trace that all the way back into the data collection? Um, Percy Lang, also at Stanford, the math behind influence functions, we'll see more and more of this being work, worked into the machine learning process itself. Um, there's some post hoc analysis from Microsoft called Interpret ML using EBM, explainable boosting machines. That came out last week and it's pretty good. Um, but the, the point here is that data science teams need to rethink how they're managing the data workflows all the way up to the point of having very rigorous ways to put together training sets and don't throw away information at every step. Then when the auditors come knocking, that's going to be the issue. So uh, Chris Ray has the point about lineage and just where does the rubber hit the road on model management and lineage and how does data governance come into play with the hardest problems that we have currently with machine learning. Um, I have an a exec briefing on active learning, semi-supervised learning, which would help out on and some of this I won't go into detail about it. Um, but it, it really points to the fact that, number one, product management for AI, that book isn't written yet. We're learning about it. Pete Skomark will cover more. Um, in the larger scope, if anybody comes to you and says machine learning is just engineering, walk them out the door. Um, seriously, I mean, this is the hardest problem we have to deal with right now. That's part of the disconnects we've seen, and we won't get past the, the regulatory problems and, and governance problems without it. Um, and so, through the six decades, we've had this kind of lens. This is how things evolve and change, and it's still ongoing. Um, so, thank you very much. I look forward to talking to people afterwards. If you want to get a hold of me, here's some places. Thank you. <laughs>